Okay, good morning. <clears throat> uh, before I start uh, to continue the calculations, uh, I want to uh, say a few words about discussions about the limitations of the GP limit or the infinite width limit, which I uh, ended up my talk yesterday uh, about, um, and, and following uh, some of the questions that I got and, and questions here. So, uh, uh, first of all, <coughs> I said that uh, the GP limit, uh, P, P finite and goes to infinity, uh, some of the, of the weaknesses of this limit or limitations is that <coughs> it does not, W basically don't learn, only the readout weight learn. So you cannot ask questions about representations and, uh, <coughs> and uh, 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 similar, uh, similar questions. And, uh, and uh, it, it is true that what I said was, uh, uh, was true for the kind of scaling that I was assumed. Uh, that I assumed, and I'm going to assume throughout my uh, my talk that that the preactivations uh, are always given by. I just want to remind you by by this formula. So uh, the preactivations are normalized by one over square root of n. So w. So each neuron uh, has its vector uh, w uh, dotted with the uh, activity of the previous layer and then they are divided by square, 1 over square root of n. If you change uh, <coughs> this to 1 over n, which, uh, uh, which uh, Andrea called mean field, uh, 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 mean field normalization for <coughs> obvious reasons, but I won't get into, uh, into it now, uh, then, um, then, then uh, this is another limit. We can also talk about the infinite width limit where p is finite and n goes to infinity, but using 1 over n here. Uh, <coughs> alternatively, or together, you can choose, uh, you can scale other parameters, like sigma and so on. Uh, but some of these uh, other limits have been discussed, maybe also here, but definitely in the literature. In that case, um, if you put 1 over n here, then the learning will kind of force to make bigger changes in w in order to uh, accommodate this uh, uh, this, this larger uh, factor in the normal in the denominator, and there <coughs> you you may uh, see as a result already in the finite p and n goes to infinity limit, you may see uh, interesting effects on representation, for instance, um, uh, and uh, that that's true. But uh, <coughs> but my my main perhaps uh, uh, point or uh, is that um, I think that the, that limit is. Um, uh, it still doesn't capture the what I think in in most cases is the more realistic limit where the number of examples are are, are large also. So, uh, <clears throat> but despite despite these uh, reservations, uh, I, I want to emphasize that the infinite width limit is 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 the starting point of many of the theories that we have. So it's very important um, uh, a very important limit. And also that in many cases, we don't have other, currently, maybe Andrea has, we don't have other, uh, other tools, analytical tools, or interesting analytical tools <coughs> to, uh, to apply uh, aside from such, such limits. So uh, it is something, it's better than nothing. <coughs> and, um, and also I want to, uh, I want to emphasize that um, when we will talk today, and uh, in, in, in research in general, when, when, uh, when we will talk about departures from GP limit, there are two types of contribution to departure. In particular, I'm talking about departures uh, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, which I am uh, I'm interested in, which is uh, P over N uh, scaled together, and alpha is order one. Um, then there are, there are two types of, uh, of deviations from the infinite width limit. One of them uh, is simply, <coughs> even if W is random, uh, even if W is not learned, only A is, uh, are learned, only the readout weights are learned, uh, still the fact that the, this random kernel matrices uh, 
are, are, are in this regime, uh, they are P by P matrices of vectors uh, of uh, n dimension with this random W, uh, it, it does affect the statistical properties of the functions of this uh, of this kernel. So the kernels are not self-average anymore. Okay. So this this uh, one type of uh, deviations departures, uh, but another type of departure, as I already hinted, is that in the in this limit, uh, the W the kernels uh, uh, show uh, effects of learning. So it's not simply random uh, kernels a anymore. <clears throat> okay, and finally, there was a, a, a remark. There were remarks here, and I also questions later on about the relation to initialization problem. And I said, no, 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 no. We are talking about equilibrium statistical mechanical theory. There is no, there is no memory of where you started. Th that's true conceptually, and I want you to keep in mind that that conceptual uh, framework. But uh, but still, uh, it's an interesting question, is there any, does this theory say something, or can say something about uh, the, about the initialization problem? And the answer is yes, it's not, I, I'm not making a, a, a something that I can prove, or not, at least not, not, not yet, but we did uh, uh, do a, a, a numerical experiment to check it, and it turns out that, uh, <coughs> that uh, at least qualitatively, um, the, the role of, um, of sigma, remember the, the regularizer, the alto regularizer in equilibrium theory, is somewhat analogous, uh, let's talk about zero temperature, it's somewhat analogous to uh, a deterministic, um, uh, a deterministic uh, let's say, graded descent dynamics, uh, uh, which starts from initial, uh, initial values of, of the parameter theta, uh, and then sigma will be the analogous of the of the weights of uh, the the weights uh, Gaussian prior that you you use at, uh, at the initial at the initialization. So uh, a small sigma means that you start from narrow distribution that you you, you sample the initial condition uh, with with narrow Gaussian. So so the prior at equilibrium uh, is somewhat analogous to the to the uh, to the prior in, in the dynamic sense that what weights you sample uh, at, the, at the initialization, but but that's at least qualitatively uh, uh, similar. <coughs> but again, uh, but I want to emphasize that that's only a qualitative uh, similarity. Okay, very good. So now I want to we uh, I want to go uh, on with the uh, theory and. In particular, I want to uh, to do something about integrating the weight. So I want to uh, remind you. Okay, so that if we integrate if we integrate out the readout weights, integrating that that was step one. Integrating. A, the readout weight. Then we got uh, a marginal probability on, on W, I, I write PL of W, to, to emphasize that we are at the stage where only integrated A, uh, then we have uh, the partition function, uh, and then we have the, the bias, the L2 bias on W. Then we have <coughs> and we have the entropic term. And I remind you K and this are K's are the top layer kernels. So K twill L is K L plus the temperature, and then KL itself is sigma square over N times the dot product of uh, uh, the dot product of XL, the dot product of X. I, I, I don't keep track of where the indices are, upper layer, uh, upper script or lower script, but okay, anyway. So these are the dot product of the top layer activation 
in response to a pair of training inputs. So this is P by P kernel matrix. Okay? And, and of course, this is all dependent on W. So this is an, a complicated function <coughs> of W, of the, all the Ws. Okay? So, so far? Okay, so that's what we got, uh, we got uh, <coughs> yesterday. And now we want to try to uh, integrate W. What I'm going to do is, you know, in, 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 the, in the physics uh, uh, spirit, is you, you basically want to compute the partition function so by integrating out the degrees of freedom, because the partition function can be then used to generate all the statistics that you want. All right, but so th suppose I want to, you know, to integrate this. So to compute z, it means to integrate the unnormalized uh, quantity. This. Now, that's that horrible problem. So the way we're going to do it is, first of all, I'm going to simplify this expression so that it will be better looking and give some idea how to proceed. And the way I simplify is the way, um, the way physicists simplify things. So first of all, let me, let me then uh, erase here and, and write this as a, a partition function problem. So I'm just integrating all w. That's the problem. That's the problem because then I can, you know, add here sources and take derivatives and calculate whatever I want. <clears throat> okay. So I want to, I, I'm going to write this, uh, and I said that in physics, you simplify things but first make them more complex. And the way we do it here, by adding integration variables, which seems crazy if you want to simplify it, but it turns out it actually simplifies. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, p-dimensional vectors t. I'm adding integration variables, p of them. Okay, it's not so bad compared to n square or n square times uh, times l, but nevertheless, I'm uh, I, I'm adding those integrals, and then you can see that these terms I can I can simplify in the following way. This term will be will not be touched. Of course, we love this term. But here I'm going to write plus i t transpose y <coughs> minus one half t transpose k twill l t. So th these are these are Gaussian variables for given w Gaussian. Inter so why, why this is true? Because you, you can, we can do it uh, on, in your head. If you integrate t, this is Gaussian integration, you get, uh, you, you get the log determinant of this here, and you get the linear term with sandwich with the inverse of k, which is this. Okay, so that's straightforward. <coughs> All right, and now I am going to use the fact, and again, for you it will be longer to write down, but I'm using my privilege that I have this. So I'm going to uh, just write it, write it out explicitly. So there will be two terms here. There will be KL, the kernel itself, and then there will be the temperature term. Oh, you know what? Let, let's, let's declare zero temperature uh, for now, because things will be things will be just simpler in the notation, not in principles. So then k twill is just k. Let's, go. let's leave it like this. Good. So now let's, let's unpack this term. What is this term? This term is uh, just, just the exponential of this term. So I have e to the minus 1 half t transpose. So let's write what it is. It is sigma square over n times uh, sum over mu and nu, you know, of t mu, and then we have k, we have phi of wi dot x mu x uh, l minus 1 times phi over square root of n here times phi of wi dot x, sorry for the subscript now, of square root of n, summing over i and summing over i. 
and T nu here. So this is it. So I can now take some, you know, summation of an I outside, and I, since each WI, remember, is an independent Gaussian with respect to the prior here, so it's, it's nice to write it as E to the, this is just E to the minus one half, then I have sum over I, uh, then I have sigma square over N for each I in the exponent times T transpose times K, you know, I can write it as K of W, of WI times T. Well, K of WI is the contribution to the kernel from the ith node. The ith node is the, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this L, L layer, and I'm talking about this node I, and this is the L minus one. This is the L minus one X, X L minus one. And this is the node here. And now why I'm doing this, because uh, because here, you see what, what W is, is w, is, w appears here and here, right? So uh, if I write this, uh, I want to basically to integrate, I want to average over W now, right? So I'm taking the, I'm switching the, the, the order of integration, I want to average this of W. But to average this of W is like, then averaging over W, averaging this business over W, L, is like product, just looking at, at the, the W dependence, is like the product from I to N of each one of these guys, of averaging of E to the minus one half sigma square over N, T transpose K W I and uh, T, and then average this over W I Gaussian, because this is this, is this integration with this, with this uh, factor here. So this is Gaussian integration. Well, Gaussian integration, so uh, whatever it is, okay. So uh, we do the integral. Each one of them is independent, so we do this integral. And, uh, and then we, uh, the, this, all, all these integrals will be the same, right, because it's homogeneous. So this is some, some factor, so I call this, uh, I call this, uh, so the whole thing will be, exponent of n, because I have n of this, times some function which I call g of, of the integration variable t. I'm switching the orders of integration. I'm first doing w and then, uh, and later on we'll do t. And g of t then, you can see that g of t is the log of this, is the log of Gaussian average of e to the minus one half sigma square over n of uh, t transpose k w i t. Right, so this is, this, is, this is our g. In fact, we can write g uh, in somewhat, rather than, so we can forget about i here, right, just one vector. We can write this uh, in somewhat uh, simpler form uh, in, in this, the fact that what is kW? This is just this, the product of one, one guy of this. And we, we already discussed this yesterday. This is like Gaussian variable, another Gaussian variable, and they are correlated. And I have p by p of them, right, for each, for each pair of mu nu. So you can also, you know, write this as, uh, as log of exponent of minus sigma square over 2n times t transpose times phi of z, phi of z prime, uh, of z transpose, sorry, times t, and then average over z, where z is a p-dimensional vector, which is the pre-activation. So z is a p-dimensional random Gaussian vector. P dimensional random Gaussian variable. And this, okay, make me write it here. So Z is the average is zero, and Z is the transpose, 
the covariance of this Gauss, of this P activation, we already know what they are. They are sigma square. I'm talking about the, the correlation between these two P activations, a sigma square over N times the dot product of the, of the excess. So this is basically sigma square. Uh, this is basically the, the, the kernel at the, at, the, at the next level. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if you want G uh, is, uh, is a complicated function of T where you, it's coming out of the integration of this quantity with respect to Z where this is a function of the Z-dimensional Gaussian variables where the covariance of them is the lower level kernel which depends on the lower level Ws. So we are integrating the top layer Ws and we get a function of T and of course also of the lower level, lower layer kernel. Yes, there was a question here. Yes, sorry, so I just don't quite see the notation there. So, so this G, I think you were just saying, depends, it's still random. It still depends on the lower W. Right, right. So what what I'm doing, right. So uh, so what I'm doing here, yeah, I should have said it. Uh, you're right. Um, okay. So I'm, what I'm saying, uh, yeah, here it is. I, I'm I'm integrating out. I should say it. So this is this is uh, 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 step one. Uh, step two, I, I I didn't say it. Okay. So step two will be to integrate over L only. That's what I'm doing. Thanks for for reminding me. I, I should have said it at the beginning. What, the, the, what I'm doing here is this is what uh, we call the, the, the work backpropagating uh, kernel renormalization. We are backpropagating not in the sense of backpropagation of errors uh, in learning, but backpropagation in, in the sense that we are integrating out degrees of freedom from the top layer successively to the, to the bottom layer. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the strategy. Uh, and that reminds me also that uh, that what I'm talking now is uh, is uh, based on the paper with Xi'an Yi Li uh, in PRX 2021. Back propagating kernel renormalization. So thank you for reminding me because I forgot to say it. So this is step two. Step two. This would still be a function of W, of the rest of W. So let's put it W prime. All the W's in lower layer. So we're peeling out the system. It's somewhat reminiscent of other uh, areas in, in statistics, in machine learning, but also in, in, in physics, where we do renormalization group or, or uh, integration of degrees of freedom in successive terms. And here we're using, philosophically, we're using the the layered structure of the architecture to our advantage. So, so what I'm doing here is just integrating now the next step, integrating out the top layer degrees of freedom. And that's what I've been doing here. This WI is an individual vector, that, as, as I showed. And you end up then with this, uh, with this G, OK? So you can, we can pull everything together, put it together, and say that what we have now is uh, Z of, uh, of W prime. The next stage is uh, integral, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, e, e, e to the, all the rest of the, so I put it prime, all the rest of the layers. And then I have uh, plus, sorry. Prime. Integral dt. So this is integral dt. I, uh, this is the remaining w. Then I have plus i t transpose y. And then I have here, I don't remember if I used to write plus or minus for g. Well, plus. Um, plus, good. 
plus g of n times g of t, which is a function of all the other w's. Okay? And it's a function of all the other w's through the dependence on the loyal, on the loyal kernel. This is where all the other w's uh, are embedded now. Okay. Good. So, so now, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, uh, statistical mechanics learning is basically understanding how to handle this uh, Hamiltonian uh, or, or this partition function or Hamiltonian on all W. And now I'm telling you that the statistical mechanic goal is to understand how to handle this. Okay? So this is, this is still a problem. I, I, I have to integrate over T, but G of T is a, is a, is a very non-trivial function of t. It looks maybe nice, but, you know, sandwiched between z's and so on, but still uh, you have to do this integration uh, to get the function of t. So I turned the problem, so to speak, into, uh, into handling this uh, integral over t. So at this point, I, I, I stopped doing the... This is so far, I didn't make any assumptions. It's a general, except from the architecture and the non you know, the normalization and so on and so forth. Uh, so, but, but at this point I stop because I, I, I don't know how to continue. Well, you can do all kinds of approximations and we do, we try approximating this G of T to make, to make progress. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, what, what we have been doing is uh, switching now to a very special uh, architecture and that's the main topic of, uh, of today, and this is uh, linear networks, deep linear network. So we are going to start from here and uh, see that in the case of deep linear network, this, is, uh, this can be done. And it's still highly non-trivial structure, as you'll see, uh, and, and, and a very rich one that one, uh, one gets from here. Okay, so I want to leave this. I want to erase this. Yeah, before that, I just erase another. Answer questions. What if if you if, if you have just one layer? Yeah. Well, th then you still the G of T or oh, I raise over the G of T is still uh, would depend on the, the dependence on T will be complicated. So because okay, so I erased it. That's terrible. Okay, so let's let's write it again. G of t. So let me write it again. It's a log of the average of e to the minus one half sigma square over n times uh, times phi of z uh, t transpose phi z phi z prime t. Right. So if you know how to do it for the general, so let's say let's say we are okay, and z z prime is here. So let me just copy it here. Z z prime z, z transpose. Sorry, it is k l minus one. So you are saying okay, k l minus one will be the input kernel. That's good. But still, it it makes things somewhat simpler. But still, I have to do this integral, and the nonlinearity is still here. Okay, so I'm still don't. It's not. I don't know what to do essentially. Okay, so even to peel out one layer using this formulation, the nonlinearity, you know, gives me a very complicated. Well, you can do numerics or sampling, whatever. I mean, but still, you have this. You have this barrier to. Do. Physicists know to compute, you know, Gaussians, harmonic oscillators, the I mean, you know. It's an interesting case. If it, well, okay, so if you, this is why we are here. If, if you have ideas, I'd, I'd like to hear, okay? You can do perturbation theory, you know, all kinds of things, and I'd, I'd love to, to do it, but, and, and some of them I have done, and you can read in papers, um, do uh, perturbation theory expansions and so on. Um, 
And, and again, by the way, for, for, for the GP limit, you can see how things simplify because this is P by P. Everything here is you know, P-dimensional. So this is, this is order, order P, and this is 1 over N. So it's P over N. If P is finite and N goes to infinity, this is small. You can expand. And OK, OK. So now I'm switching to a deep linear neural networks. And by this, I simply mean that phi of z is z. So everything is linear. So there is no nonlinearity. OK? So then I'm, 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 I'm up to this stage, everything is the same. OK? Um, OK, but before that, let me say a few words about deep linear neural networks just to put you in context. So what does it mean that, that, uh, that uh, the network is linear? So, it means that the input-output relation uh, is going to be, uh, the, the predictor is linear. So it is going to be, um, you know, A transpose WL, WL minus 1, etc., up to W1, up to X. So, so the relation between input, between the predictor, and the, between the input X and the predictor, the output of the network, is linear. So that means that in terms of computation, this is not doing more than a single layer without even hidden layer, right? So, so that's, of course, the, the limitation of this model, that it doesn't really give you, in terms of computation, the, the, the depth doesn't do anything. Uh, so the expressivity, the capacity is all determined by the, uh, is all like, like, like a linear mapping from input to output. Okay, so for instance, uh, in our case, if you ask, okay, at what stage, uh, what, is the, what is the tradition to over-parameterization? It's completely determined by the ratio between the number of patterns and the input layer. So now, you have, so now we have two parameters. Because of that, we have to, so if P is larger than N0, so L cannot be, the, the loss cannot be, cannot be zero, right? Because you have, too many, you have more linear uh, relation to satisfy between input and output uh, than parameters, than effective parameters. You have kind of zillions of parameters, but effectively you have only n0 parameters. The whole thing here is equivalent to just n, n0 weights, okay? So that's the, that's the interpolation threshold, okay? So this is why we really, in this case, we have to keep track of two parameters, alpha, which is p over n, and alpha zero, which is p over n zero. And if we want to be in the over-parameterization regime, we have to keep alpha zero less than one. So basically, alpha goes from zero up to um, n over n zero. Uh, alpha cannot be, cannot be larger than that. Just to, just to uh, keep track of that. So, um, OK, so that's about the interpolation threshold. Um, and, uh, and therefore, we can say, you know, P is large, uh, alpha is large, but we have to, we can, of, of course, work also in the other side of the interpolation threshold. But if you want to, to limit ourselves to the discussion of zero temperature and over-parameterization regime, this will be the relevant regime. OK, so for instance, the input kernel uh, will will uh, will be singular uh, when uh, when you when alpha zero is bigger than one, right? So uh, okay, so uh, so this is this is the the, the linear. Nevertheless, the dynamics uh, the, the the loss function is highly nonlinear function because of this product of all these w's, and the statistical mechanics is also highly nonlinear. It's not quadratic problem. This is why, as you will see, the solution is rather complex and rich. OK, so now let's go back to the calculation in this case. So basically, I want to do this calculation. I want to do this g of t to calculate this. But now I'm in a better position because phi is linear. So now I can write this in the linear case as z z transpose t, where z is this, this random Thing with the kernel KL minus 1. Okay, so OK, 
Okay, so if, if you unpack this one, okay, so what you find is that, uh, um, where I should write, I should write. Okay, I'll write here. Okay, so what you have really is uh, in this exponent you have uh, one half, uh, I'm writing it more explicitly, one half sigma square over n times uh, t transpose uh, times. Um, There will be sigma n square, mu you nu, know, t mu, w dot with x, l minus 1 mu, times w uh, dot with x, l, min uh, l minus 1 nu, times t nu. So this is the expression. And you see that it is now quadratic in the w's. I want to do this integral. So it's quadratic in the, I can do it with z, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so it's quadratic in W. So then the whole integral here, this is the integral over the Gaussian Z or the Gaussian W. So the whole integral is, is now quadratic. So this is why I can do the integral. So this is, I can write this as one half. Okay? Sigma square over, uh, over N times W transpose times some matrix MW where M is the col uh, collecting all the terms here, multiplying, you know, two w's, right? So it's, okay. And m going to be, I want to keep this, I want to keep this, so that, uh, I want to keep this, too many things to keep. And m has the structure of uh, one over n times x, L minus 1 times T, T transpose, X, L minus 1 transpose. Right? This, what, what M is, is collecting the coefficients of two W. So there will be X, X, and there will be T and T. So this is here, okay? But you can see that, you can see from this structure here, you can see already see here that, uh, that W, uh, that, that this is, this cares only about w in the direction of x or uh, x, uh, x. So, so it, is, it is a low rank structure. And indeed, you can see it here that m, m is n by n matrix, but has a low rank structure because it depends on this, on this vector dotted with itself. Okay? So m is an outer product of, of uh, one dimension of, of a vector with itself. So it's a very, it's one rank matrix. Okay. This, is, this is rank one. This is the summing over all the x's multiplying by t. So it's a rank one n-dimensional vector, an outer product with itself. Okay. Good. So now we have to do this integral. To do this integral, we have this term. And then we shouldn't forget plus one half sigma square of W transpose W, which is coming from the bias. So I have to add this to this. I have to add this to M, and then do the Gaussian integral of W. Okay? But then we know the solution to that. So this finally gives the solution, which is that uh, G is uh, minus one half log of the determinant of i, there is i sigma square, and I normalized out sigma, so there will be i times sigma 4 of this matrix m over n. This is, n, this is, this is, this is log determinant of an n by n matrix, because I integrated n degrees of freedom, which is a w. Okay? But now, because m is rank 1, it's actually this, is, this uh, collapses to the trace of m. So this is just a number. This is just minus one half log of one plus the trace of m times sigma to the four of m. Okay, so that's cool. It's just a number. Okay, this is also a number, but it's not the, I, the log determinant is just the log of this number. Okay, so now we are basically we are basically done because the trace of M 
is simply um, sigma to the 4 over n. It is the trace of m you can see from here by your eyes. Right? The trace of this is taking this dotted with itself. So it's kl minus 1 with the t's. So that's sigma square over n times t transpose kl minus 1t. Cool. We got back the low, level, low layer kernel. OK. So what do we got here? So let me put it here. So then this is now dt <coughs> exponent. We, we already took care. Let me forget about this. I, we remember this. We just have to do, we have to think about this. Right? What it, this is? This is uh, i t transpose y plus n. So I put it back, minus 1 half. I have n of this, right? So this is this n times log of 1 plus sigma square over n, t transpose kl minus 1 t. OK, that's it, OK? So now I have to, I'm, I'm focusing on the integral over t, right? That's what we have to get, get rid of. But OK, what do we do now, Lenka? OK, so let's say kl minus 1 is k0. Even in the linear case, the action for t is not Gaussian. Right? It is the log of this and so on. OK? Rimi, what do we do at this stage? Take coffee, and then what? Not coffee, espresso. What, but we don't bring the coffee in the room. <laughs> what do we do? No, maybe some saddle point also. What? Some kind of? Saddle point estimation? Of course. So remember, we are working in the, in the alpha order one regime. So P is loud, and N is loud, but also P is loud. There is, you know, so, P is, so we have high dimensional integral over T, OK? But this is a scalar function of all the T's. So this is our candidate for an order parameter. This is something that. We will do that by saddle point. We'll say this is self-average. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to say that this, we're going to, uh, how do we handle this kind of uh, saddle point or the parameter where you have high dimensional integral, but is a function of, of a scalar number, a scalar function of all these variables. We just introduce uh, delta functions on this. So we're going to do this. We're going to write now, an, integral over h l minus 1, integral over u l minus 1. We have dt, of course. These are scalars. This is p-dimensional, right? And then we have exponent. And now we have here i t transpose y. Then we have minus n over 2 log of 1 plus this guy. I call it u, u l minus 1. Oh, I call it some. So h doesn't matter. H l minus one. I define this as my h, okay? And then I'm putting in the exponent. I'm putting a delta function so that we, I normalization two c sigma square just for normalization. H l minus one, u l minus one. Okay. So this is a delta function that h has to be this. So then there will be minus u l minus 1 times this, times sigma square over n times t transpose k l minus 1 times t. This is, this is all in the exponent. I'm going here somewhat slower because, not be, first of all, this is my first coffee only. But also because, um, because I want to show you how, how you do theory in practice, right? I mean, how, what's going on? So, um, yeah, there was sigma square here, but I put it here, so there is no sigma square here. Sorry. Good. OK, so let me see where we got, OK? I want you now to compare this to this. OK, here we said we have to integrate WL. And here's what we got. We had IT transpose Y minus this, right? Here I have 
what do I have here? After integrating WL, I have IT transpose Y, forget about the other one, times this, my exponent of this. This IT transpose Y, I need colors. Because now we see the drama. This is IT transpose Y, and this is the second term which depends on T. I'm looking at the T dependence. Look at here. Here I have IT transpose Y, and I have this, KL. I integrate out WL, and I got a similar looking object, except that now it's KL minus 1, but now there is a, a factor here which multiplies this kernel, OK? So integrating out the L, domain, L layers, L layer, I reduce KL, of course, to KL minus 1, but I pay the price, the, the, the degrees of freedom which I integrated out are now compressed into this number. This is a scalar, U L minus 1. So this is, you see how, why we call it kernel renormalization. You integrate out degrees of freedom, then the remaining kernel is renormalized by this integrated degrees of freedom into this scalar. And now you can see in large P limit, N and P is large, this is order N, this is order P, this is order N, this is, um, well, uh, there is no N here because they put the N here, sorry. This is order P, right? I put the N here. So this is order P, U, L minus 1. This is order P, OK? So everything is order N and P extensive, but these are integrals of a scalars. So we can do saddle point on them. So we can just get rid of these integrals. And we just have these guys with the H's and U's are satisfying the self-consistent equations that come from uh, taking the derivative of this exponent and keeping it into zero. Okay, so they become really all the parameter in the statistical mechanical sense. Okay? Okay, Lenka? Good. So, okay, so I, I, I of course, this is the homework how to do this, uh, uh, take derivative and get the equations. Uh, and I'll just do it for you, telling you what, what you get. And you get something interesting. Uh, for uh, you, you get one derivative, which is simple. You know, take derivative of this and this. Then you get ul. Ul is one over one plus hn minus one. But the other equation which you, that, is, that you get is kind of more interesting, and in that you get that ul minus one is sigma square times one minus alpha plus n minus 1 times y transpose times ul minus 1 times kl minus 1 inverse yt. Why? So uh, you have to remember u is scalar, so you can take it out as 1 over u, but I'm writing it this way that to make sure that you see the, you see the, you see the structure. Okay? So this is a self-consistent, look at this equation, this is a self-consistent equation for our renormal, kernel renormalization or the parameter. You have, to, you have to solve this equation. This one over u, this is u, it's quadratic equation in u. But what's interesting is that if you remember yesterday, I talked about the readout weight uh, norm squared. And I said, and we got that the readout weight norm square is, one, is sigma squared times 1 minus alpha, which comes from the fluctuations in the null space, plus this term, which is the norm square, which is the mean of the A squared, okay, which has Y transpose KL inverse Y. And now you see this is the same structure. So now this is now the same A transpose A over N, Okay, but now average not only over A, but also on the WL minus 1. So this all the parameter UL minus 1, which renormalizes the kernel, is simply the self-consistently the square of the norm of the readout weights, integrated now twice over A and over averaged over A and WL minus 1. So that's a very neat interpretation of what's going on. This is what normalizes the kernel, is the, is the non-trivial 
uh, readout weight uh, norm square, which is because of this structure, it is self-consistently to be solved. So you can think about it as a self-consistent equation for the norm of the of the of the of the of the readout weight. Okay. Yes. So here, uh, the, when you integrate over A and W, so yes. Uh, when you integrate over A, it's already a constant, right? No, 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 no. A, a, well, b b before integrating, A is one of the variables that we are doing integration. Now, we, we, we average this over A. It's still th this norm. You remember what we had before integrating over WL minus 1, we had that, uh, that the norm is uh, 1 minus alpha. It's not a constant. It is plus N minus 1 times Y transpose times the inverse of the Lth kernel Y, which depends on all the Ws, including the Lth. So now I'm integrating this over the WL. I'm sorry. You're right. This is WL, I meant. I need to use over WL, and I got this. It still depends on the WL minus 1. Okay? So this was WL. Okay? And what about the H variables? So, so the, the H is just, you know, the U is the interesting guy. The H is 1 over this minus 1. This is the relation between H and U. Uh, this is, again, L minus 1. I'm, I, I, you know, the... H is just related to U in this way, but the interesting quantity in terms of interpretation is the U. Because, and, and this is what renormalizes the kernel. Okay, so, so now you can see, okay, so now you say, okay, if there is only one layer, then I'm done, because KL minus 1 is just K0, that's the input kernel. Okay, but if I have 100 layers, then what do I do? But you can see now the program, because... Uh, I started from this, and I said, well, how do you do this? OK, so I, we show g of t and so on. Now I want to do next stage is the same story, because forget about these h's, because there are other parameters. But in terms of the t, the same structure, except that I'm carrying out this u. But now I am do the same thing, OK? So what is, how do I integrate k minus 1? I get this g again, and do the integral. But now I'll get here. The, K, the XL minus 2, XL minus 2, and I have the log, and I have the same story, okay? And I get, now that I have a product, I have a new U, which will, which will multiply this, or the old one. And I get collecting this product of the U's as I integrate out all the, all the layers, okay? And I'm just going to tell you the end result. So after you do the whole thing, you, you're done, okay? So what you get is every time you do it, you get the same structure, and then you, uh, with the renormalization, until you are, you are done, and then when you are done, what you get <coughs> after you do everything, you get basically. Ah, so I, again, I, I should have said that's one more step is that you, you, you already here you can see if uh, once I'm at this stage, I forgot to say, once I'm at this stage. I can easily do the integral over t. What well, I forgot to say, but it's important, right? Because then I can say that after integrating the WL, the remaining Hamiltonian, which remains after integrating t, except for the, except for the, so there will be dW, uh, you know, integrating over the rest and the prior, but the interesting quantity will now be minus one half y transpose times the renormalized kernel uh, 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 inverse y minus one half log over the determinant of the renormalized kernel. So I get the same structure as we started, right? This is what we started before integrating w. And, and I introduced T, and I did all this work, and all this work I did, and then I get this. Now I have to do this. And again, I'm doing with T, and I'm doing with all the parameters, and so on and so forth. And then at the end, what you get is the total Z, which is this. After integrating out everything, 
you get exponent of minus one half y transpose times u, I call it u zero because at the end, u zero to the power L of k zero, everything minus one times y minus n over two, uh, this should be L for n here, n over two times log over the determinant of u zero L times k zero. So now this, this is just the full partition function of the problem. You can think uh, there is no more w's, right? So this is just, uh, I'm sorry, the determinant, so that you know, minus one half. Determinant, sorry. No n, okay. So this is the full partition function of the problem. If we want, this is the exponential of the free energy, or, or you can think about it as the effective volume of the solution space. After you integrate all the, all the W partition function, you can think about it as kind of, um, in, in this sense, kind of the, the en exponential of the entropy of this, of this large volume of the solution space, and it's given by this. And then U0 is having a similar equation. U0 is sigma squared times 1 minus alpha plus N minus 1 times y transpose times u0 to the L k0 inverse times u. So you have to solve this self-consistent equation for u. Sorry. Yes? Why is it not u0 times u1 until u1 minus 1? For some problems we do this. For this problem we find it's m this is the this is the way to do it because because remember deep in the network you don't feel what the output what the loss is and so on so on you know you have to penetrate all these w's 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 here you start from the readout weight it already gives you the learning we got read you know the signal for the w is coming from the top layer right so so the first thing you do you integrate out the top layer you get the effective kernels and then you go down Okay. Not, uh, oh, sorry, I thought about. Okay, so what is the question? Sure, absolutely right. But at the cell point, they're all equal. Oh, okay. And this is homework for you. This is true only if the width is equal. Okay. If the widths are not equal, if you have n1, n2, n3, then you have non trivial product of all the parameters and you have to solve them self consistently. It's an interesting yeah. problem. But because I assume the width is the same, at the saddle point, they all collapse to u0 to the f. That's a good question. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. OK, so now we are done. This is, you have the data, OK? So you, you, you put the data, whatever problem it is. We, we didn't assume anything about the data. You, you know, you just input kernel here, the label, the target labels here. You have alpha is p over n, sigma is sigma, the regularizer. You have to solve it self-consistently and determine your order parameter u0. And now, how much time I have? OK, good. So let me say a few more words. OK, so and then a, a few more equations and formulas, and then show you, show you some results. OK, so now, OK, so that's nice. So what do I do with u0? So you can compute, uh, you can compute the change in the statistics of the weights and statistics of the kernel and so on, many things. But the most important thing for us is the, uh, is the, uh, is the predictor. So if you go back to the predictor, mean, I want to do it now at finite temperature. It's, it's very straightforward. You know, all the kernels are twiddle, so it's you know, very similar. Uh, so you, what you get is our famous K, K transpose, but now I'm putting zero to emphasize this is now the, the, the input kernel times this normalization, renormalization parameter u uh, times u0l plus the input kernel, k, uh, no, not time, times the input kernel k0 plus the temperature term i minus 1 times y. And the fluctuations 
of u zero l times k zero x x minus k zero transpose k minus u zero l times k Oh, no, I put you zero L here, I'm sorry. Uh, minus K zero transpose K uh, zero inverse K zero. K0 is a function of x, as usual. OK, so basically you see the structure. What, what happens is that it's, it's the same structure as the GP uh, case, where you, uh, in the GP case, you have K, GP, inverse K, Y, or the same structure of the W dependent before integrating over W, only that A, which we have this. Uh, kernel with the x is one variable, the test point times the inverse mat kernel matrix times the times labels y. And, and similarly here, the only change here that the input, that now from the all the, all the L layers, we are going to the input layer, uh, to input layer kernels. So all the kernels are now the input layer kernels, but renormalized by u0. Okay. Now you can see that what happens at zero temperature. At zero temperature, the, the, the kernel renormalization at the mean layer collapses because, because of, uh, or cancels out. So at zero temperature, the mean kernel has not changed in the linear case. You just get K0 transpose X, K0 inverse Y. No renormalization, okay? Because the numerator and the denominator collapse at zero temperature. So this is now T equal to zero. But the variants still have the connect correction. The variants will have u0 to the L times the unrenormalized story, x, x minus k0 transpose x times k0 inverse times k0. So at zero temperature limit in the deep linear networks, the, in terms of the predictor, the mean predictor is predicted to be constant in the sense of no sigma because they, they cancel out, doesn't depend on n because it all depends on the input kernel and so on, but the, but the variance will have this non-trivial renormalization, which remember is a function not only of alpha. So this will be the correction, remember I started my lecture, this will be the correction, one minus alpha, due to the fact, compared to the GP limit, due to the fact that now we're talking about the number of degrees of freedom which are learned is not negligible, it is alpha. So, so this is the correction. This, this is coming simply from the fact that we are talking about finite alpha, but this has come non-trivial uh, effect of the learning, because it depends really on the, uh, on the data, in particular on the, on the, on the target label. Okay. So, I, I want to switch now to show you uh, in, in, in figures how this translates into generalization error over parameterization, depends on, on, on depth and so on. Before you do that, uh, yeah. would you be willing to tell us a little bit about how um, u naught depends on alpha? Like, for example, if alpha goes to zero, we So, so, there, are, so the, the, there are two dependence on alphas here, right? So one is simply this factor, remember, the, the fact that the null space uh, is one minus alpha. But here, but this is also not, this is data dependence dependent because this is order p over n. So, so this is order alpha, but, but this depends on the data. 
Okay, so uh, in, in the GP limit, basically what happens is that this is negligible, alpha is negligible, you get U0 sigma square, and we all know that in the GP limit, what you get in the variance here is the sigma to the 2L. So if, if you compare it to the linear network with the GP limit, okay, you will get simply U0 is sigma square. Because this is the way the GP kernel in the L layer uh, collapses to, collapses to the input kernel times sigma square. So the, the difference is that now the, the, this factor now is not a trivial sigma square, but it really depends on alpha, on, on P, and P and N, and so on, and, and on the data, on, on, the, on the task. Okay. What about as alpha goes to infinity? Fine. So that, that's, that, that, that's interesting. So this looks like something ha funny happens when alpha goes to infinity. It turns out that U0, and therefore the prediction here, are smooth as you go from alpha to z from alpha from zero to infinity. Now, of course, you cannot go to infinity because then this kernel gives you trouble, right? So you have to go up to, as I said, uh, n over n zero, but let's suppose uh, this is fine, n zero is large and so on. So as long as you don't hit the singularity in k zero, you are fine. There are, there are interesting effects of alpha being bigger than one or less than one, okay? And that's what I'm going to show in the figures. But, but there is no pathology, at least not for the, for user. There are some, some effects that there are, but maybe I'll have time to talk about it, but, but not, not for the normalization. Okay, so I want to switch. Uh, can, can I get this down? Okay, so um, this is fine. That's okay. Okay, so uh, let me just stay here. Okay, so this is this is the story you know already, but I want to show you results. So there are many, ex you know, the the, the 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 strength of the theory and the weakness. The strength of the theory, the theory is that we don't make specific assumptions about the data. The weakness is that you want to actually uh, uh, show some concrete results, you better choose some problems. But we, 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 we looked at a variety of problems. One of them is kind of uh, uh, the linear network tries to uh, uh, label, uh, binary labeling uh, of cluster data. So you imagine half of them are, are tagged with plus one Y and half of them with minus one Y and they are noisy. and and, uh, and 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 the network has to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 predict the, the label correctly. Or, or we did MNIST, where we took two uh, two uh, images from from the zero and one, and we did again. It's a regression, but we mimicked it as a binary classification: plus one for this, and minus one for this. But there are many other examples, like student teacher and. And, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but let me get back to the, uh, go show you concrete results. So now, th so this is one of the examples, it doesn't matter. So the important thing is, so how it depends on the width. So remember, so what I'm showing here, generalization error as a function of the width n for, any, for fixed data. So n0 is fixed and, uh, and, and p is fixed. Uh, I'm only showing n. So in this case, the GP limit says that, not, of course, it n goes to infinity limit, so there is no n dependence, okay? And what I'm showing you, the theory, what I described here, and, uh, and the simulations. The simulations, I mean, the analog of uh, Langevin dynamics um, at zero temperature, okay? So this is this generalization error, and I'm, we're breaking into the contribution from the bias and the contribution from the bias. Now, as you see, the bias is flat. It is equal to the GP limit, as I said, because the renormalization of the kernel is just a, is just a scalar. So at zero temperature, the scalar, uh, the scalar drops out. So the bias remains 
the same as doesn't depend on n. But the variance depend on n, and therefore the generalization error depends on n. And you would see there are two regimes, what we call strong regime, strong regularization regime, where sigma is smaller than something, and weak regularization, uh, regularization regime when sigma is larger than something. And you see the important effect of the regularization. So if the regularization is uh, weak, uh, I'm sorry, is strong, then the generalization error is improving with n. You gain by being more overparameterized. Why? Intuitively, because you have an, the, the inductive bias of, of small a squared and so on is keeping you a good, sol keeping, delivering a good solution even though you increase the number of parameters of the system. Okay? Uh, and uh, you can see it in terms of the variance. And, uh, and, and similarly here, but, uh, in co conversely here, if the regularizer is weak, so sigma is above some number, uh, then actually you are overfitting with, uh, as n is larger, in the sense that the variability in the possible solution the, the, uh, is, is killing you. The, the huge solution space, uh, you don't have enough regularization, so actually it's better to be in a narrow, uh, uh, narrow uh, 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 network than, than wide network. Okay, so whether to be good or bad in terms of wide or narrow, uh, it, it depends here in this case uh, about the strengths or on the strengths of the regularization. Yes. Can you just tell us if you have the values of n zero and p? If if I have what? What are the values of n zero and p? Uh, I have to look at the paper, uh, but 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 uh, but but I can tell you that. Uh, that we are still, even, uh, even um, you know, P over N0 is still less than 1 in all this regime. P over N0 is still less than 1. So we are, we are in the regime of open parameterization in the sense that there is always, everywhere here, the training error is 0. Okay? okay. okay we fix P. We fix n0, and in order to be in the overparameterization regime, p over n0 is p is fixed, n0 is fixed, yes. and p is less than n0. I was wondering about, and if it was sorry, bigger than one, the opposite. I'll show. I'll show. Yeah. I'll show so results. No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll show results. Okay. Uh, so, so now we want to show the dependence on depth. Is it good to be deeper or not? So, again, it depends on the regularization. So. The dashed lines are the, are the GP limit for these uh, values of parameters. So in both cases, the parameters are chosen such that the GP limit predict a divergence of the kernel and therefore also the error, the divergence of the variances of the predictor as L goes to infinity. Very quick divergence for, this, for the parameters that we chose. Okay? So, so this is the dashed line. But you see, interestingly, that very different behavior in the case of the uh, finite alpha. So here, uh, it actually goes down with L. The variance goes down, and therefore the generalization error goes down with L. So you, because, because, the, the, uh, uh, because in this regime, the regularization is strong enough, you know, there is alpha dependence here, so actually you gain uh, with that. Here it's a regime with what we call weak regularization, so here it actually goes up with L, but it's, it's saturated or, or goes up very, very slowly compared to, the regular, compared to the GP limit. So you see also here that the dependence on depth is very different uh, or can be dif different from, drastically different from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the GP limit. And this is a kind of a, a phase diagram, if you want, a summary phase diagram of the dependence on L n on the width, which is alpha. So p is fixed, but n is changing. n on the, param on the strength of the regularization. And here you see that alpha equals to 1, in some sense, is the transition, not in the singularity sense, but it separates a regime which we call narrow, uh, uh, narrow networks and wide networks. This is not narrow and wide in terms of interpolation, because as I said, the, the interpolation threshold is alpha 0 equals to 1. In the entire regime here, we're talking about alpha 0 less than 1. 
but it's narrow and wide in terms of the dependence on, uh, uh, of the generalization error uh, on, uh, on L and, on, uh, and, and on, on sigma square. So you can see in, in, the, in the wide regime, then as you I increase this, the, the strength of the, so sigma square large, if you weaken the regularization, then you go from a regime where the dependence on, where you improve with L, decrease with L, to a regime where the, the error increases with L. Whereas if you are in the narrow regime, then for small sigma, which is strong regularization, you increase the error with L, versus here you decrease the error with L. So you see that the dependence on L, on the, on the depth, is not trivial. We talked about yesterday about you know, simple principles and understanding and so on. But you see that even in this simplest model or architecture of deep linear networks, how complex the behavior can be. The dependence on the width, the dependence on, uh, on the strength of the regularization, and this controls the dependence on the depth. In some cases, weak regu a strong regularization, weak regularization, switch it in one way, and in, other, in, in, in another case, in another way. Okay. Why is it so that despite the fact that in the GP limit, the generalization error in diverges with L, whereas here, it is happy. Here it is happy, here it is happy, here it goes to a constant, here it goes to zero. But how come? The answer is that you remember that U, zero, is sigma square in the GP limit. So U to the L is sigma to the 2L. So if sigma is bigger than one, it goes to infinity. But here, if you look at the renormalized factor U, you see it, it, it goes to one. There is a self tuning with respect to the depth. There is a self tuning uh, property of, the order, of, the, of this order parameter to one. It's not fine tuning. We didn't decide it to be one. But if you look at the self consistent equations and you ask what happens as you go to L equals to infinity, you find that even if sigma is bigger than one, or in some regime sigma is less than one, U itself adjusts itself to asymptotically goes to one, to be kind of marginal. Okay? So the, the, the amplitude of the kernel as L goes to infinity is converging to one. And again, this is not a fine tuning, it's coming out of these equations. So somehow, the fact that you work in a finite alpha and the learning is adjusting the weights and, and the kernels in such a way to control the divergence, otherwise the divergence of the, uh, of the variance when L goes to infinity. Okay, so now here is your question. So now I, I, I spoke about, previously I spoke about fixing alpha zero to be less than one and changing alpha. But you can also, I didn't, dis I didn't have time to discuss it, but you can also ask what happens when when you, 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 you vary alpha zero, okay? So, uh, so here, here is the case where you vary alpha zero. Uh, so this is the, uh, the well-known double descent uh, phenomena. When alpha zero is bigger than one, you are under-parameterized, the loss is bigger than zero. When alpha zero less than one, the loss is less than zero. Uh, and this is the error. The variance and the bias, both of them, of course, depends on alpha zero. Uh, the bias diverges at alpha zero equals to one, whereas the variance is finite here in the overparameterized regime and zero in the underparameterized regime. Can I ask you about this? I mean, I don't understand what the data were already, because how is it possible that at very small alpha I get a very good generalization error? It's a regime where I basically have very few samples for some input dimension and zero. There should not be any information there. Or maybe the data. You, you talk about, so I'm, talk, I'm talking about alpha zero. Yes, alpha zero very small means that P. So, uh, alpha zero very small, but, but as I showed before, this is this, is this regime. So, I, I, this, this is the regime where alpha zero was small, and, and, and you can see there is a regime where the generalization error is fine, okay? 
So it, whether it is close to zero, I mean, it depends on the scale, but you know, you know, so let's say we are talking about in this regime, that's fine, but now I'm, I'm saying what happened, so this is the regime of over-parameterization. How did you generate your data? Yes, can you remind us how you generate the data? To understand that it, this is actually possible. Then I can, from very few samples in rather large dimension, I can get a very small generalization No problem. We'll see what the data is. Um, a single hidden layer network, okay, and it trained on the template mode. These are the this this is the this is the the cluster uh, the cluster data. Okay. Random labeling of each cluster with parameter discovery. Okay. Well, uh, alpha zero is not zero. Alpha zero. I don't think there is a problem. Alpha zero is not zero. It can be 0.5. I mean, it's compared to this divergence. It's not zero. I mean, I was I was showing scales when alpha zero was 0.05. Okay. Just a scale here. I don't think there is a problem. It's the usual double descent. There is no, I, I, it, the, alpha zero is not zero, is 0.1, and the generalization error is not zero, is 0.05. Okay? But it seems very small. Very small compared. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a zero one. It's not a, it's not a accuracy. It's not. It is a mean square error normalized. So it's not. I mean. I mean, we can look at the numbers if you want. Okay. This is not zero, but this is this is the typical double descent problem in a, a single layer or in a, in a hidden linear layer. This is not nothing here is uh, is surprising. Okay, it's not zero, and alpha zero is not zero, and the scale is just uh, it, it just you see here this, the scale is 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Look at this, and this is this is here. Okay, this is you 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 are happy here, right? This is here. It just it does the scale is different. The, the the point here is to show this different that some sometimes you see this double descent, where the, where even when you have a double descent, sometimes the double descent the side of alpha zero large, the under parameter zero is better, or in some cases the, the the optimal is in this side. The point is when you have double descent, it doesn't tell you where is the best optimal parameters to be optimal size to be. This is the linear regression problem. What is linear regression? You have a regularizer. You don't have regular. This is the linear regression problem. But maybe what could be useful here is just the null error. Like, what's the, uh, what's the variance of the y's? Like, they just predict the error. If I would put here a scale, like, like this scale, you know, this will be here. OK, but it will go up rather than go down. Or, or here, go up rather than go down. That's all. I, I don't think there is anything. <laughs> There's nothing. Believe me, there is nothing mysterious here. We can go over the number. I can tell you the reason. The, the, I think the reason why you may be uh, you may be uh, 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 is the fact that I consistently hate to see papers where they show you results where the generalization, where the error normalized, properly normalized. We talk about the normalization is improving between point between two and two point one and make a big deal of it. So I'm insisting not to do this. And this is partly the reason why I'm not using Gaussians, like everybody does, for the input. I'm using input which has structures, and it's noisy, and the labels have some relation to the structure of the input. So philosophically, I hate to use Gaussian inputs and random labels on Gaussian inputs for learning. Even if a teacher, student teacher, I don't care. Don't use Gaussian inputs. Okay, and this is why I'm using clustered input, and therefore the generalization error in general are lower than what you expect if this was Gaussian and student teacher or something. 
and the, and, the, and the dynamic range of generalization error is larger than what you actually see between 2.1 and 2.2. That's all. What? There are too many questions. Okay, shall I show more, more, more figures and then we'll go to a break and then we can argue about it? That's my philosophy, that's all. So this is why I invented this type of task even for this problem, okay? I want the, we talk about generalization, I want the target rule to be relevant to the structure of the data. This is why the numbers may be different from what you. So how, do, how does the number of clusters change when you change uh, the number of clusters? This is the cluster data. Right. How do the number of clusters change when you scale? Do, you, do they stay fixed or do they uh, change? So, right, so, so, so it depends. So in this case, actually, P will, will increase the number of clusters. Okay. okay. So it's, it's slightly different from what you usually, usually are. I mean, it's, it's a slightly different problem. But it doesn't matter. It's just the reason why I cooked up this problem again, to get, even in this linear regime, linear regression, something which makes sense in terms of general. There is some rule which relate to the structure of the data, because I think this is more like real life, more like that, that the, the label relate to the structure of the input. Okay. But, but I, 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 Lenka, if this, was, if this was one and this was two, would you be happy not here? If this was one and this was two, would you be happy? Well, this is not, you see it in the literature, it's not something No, no, no. So the answer is no. The answer is that whether, this is an important point, whether in the case of a, a kind of interpolation threshold, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm switching. Here it is. Here is examples. Okay, here when you go, uh, you go to, to large uh, samples, you improve even compared to this. Here, you're actually better off with a small alpha zero than large alpha zero. Yeah, that's why I was asking what's the data. Okay, so we will discuss. So, yeah. But we see, it in the we see examples of that in the literature also. With, 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 not with the cooked up data like this. Haim, do you have any intuition for when you get one behavior versus the other? Um, I mean, there is a very good theory of when you get one behavior towards the other. And uh, so the question is simply whether this matches the theory and we don't get the numbers, right? It matches the theory. It's rigorous. You see, you see, you see curves which are theory and you see simulations. It matches the theory. Maybe not your theory, but it matches the theory. <laughs> there is no bug here. This is engraved in the mountains of Lesouche, in Mont Blanc. Okay, let me show you a few examples. It, it, what, what? If alpha zero was bigger than one, would the test error still depend on the... I bet that it will depend on other parameters. There is no universal answer. But, but, but it, it will depend on the regularization of sigma. Yes, yeah, yeah. because we somehow, in that case, we are just looking at the pseudo inverse, so then it should not be depending on the width anymore. I mean, as long as alpha zero... Well, in the, this is true for the non in the linear case, it's different because even in this regime, there is a degeneracy of solution because the input output is fixed. Right. So it's okay. Okay, what, what I want, okay, so, oh, you see it here. So, so that's, that's briefly an example of how the, the representation changes. So, so this is an example. So, let me briefly about the data. So, this is now two outputs. You, you can we can extend the theory to multiple outputs and then uh, look at the renormalization of the kernel in this case and the predictor. And, uh, and, and, and what's nice about it, you can see how the, the emergent representation, which means the kernels, uh, change the, uh, are, are reflecting the task. So, so the, the data is four digits from MNIST. But there are two, two there, are, there, are, there are six output units, okay? And, uh, you know, the, fir the first one, the first four are simply 
uh, a simply uh, a, a simply labeling you know this is one this is one this is one this is one that's that's, that's simply classifying this these four digits the two the other two are classifying the first zero one at one and the second one is minus one so they are they are separating this from this okay so so the the, the input is the same but the features that the six output uh, units are looking at is different. The first four are looking at the features of individual uh, individual digits. The, the 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 last one are clumping this together and this together. So there is hierarchical structure in the overall uh, output. Okay, whether you look at individual ones or whether you look at uh, uh, these ones. And now you look at the at the kernel. So uh, this is the input kernel, no no network. Uh, you can see weekly, you can see the structure of the digits from, from here. This is one block, this is another block. This is, so you have four blocks here around the diagonal, which correspond to a weak structure, but still noticeable structure of the input itself, uh, correspond to the four digits. So the four digits already at the input layer are not random. You can look at the kernel itself, see some signature of them. Now, at the output layer, this is just the y. This is just the this is just the dot product of this, the kernel of the outputs themselves. Okay, the target. Okay, and now obviously there is a hierarchical structure because this is have to do with uh, with separating uh, the four digit and clumping uh, the the first two and the second. This is just y y transpose. This is x transpose x. This is y y transpose. So this is just tells you the structure of the of the task. This is the input and this is the output. And now the question is, if you, after learning, you look at one of the hidden layers, even in this linear network, would you see something closer to this or something closer to this? You see uh, something which relate to the, these individual images, the, the structure of the input data, or an imprint of the task which had this hierarchical structure? And, uh, uh, and, and this is the answer. So you look at the hidden layer one, this after learning, again using our theory. Uh, you see more or less the, the main, main, block, uh, main block around the diagonal. But as you go to the, uh, to the, this is in case of three layer, for instance, you see now you see this very close to, to the output layer, to the YY transpose. So the, so the, the kernel uh, uh, is, uh, is reflecting at the top layer, is reflecting the actual, uh, the actual task, which is why uh, why transpose where the, 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 the first kernels uh, represent more the structure of the input. Okay, and this is just for you, uh, Andrea. I, I'm going to talk about nonlinear networks uh, in, on Monday, okay? But since he won't be here on Monday, I promised him to show him an appetizer, a teaser, okay? <laughs> so, we are, we, we, we magically, we, we cannot solve this for non-linear, for a loon network, okay? But we said, okay, so what we, you know, there is a, a scalar renormalization uh, obeying these equations, so why don't we hack and say, well, the same will be with the, with the loon network, except that, you know, this kernel times sigma square will be the GP kernel. The GP kernel is, you know, is very interesting object that uh, Yasaman will talk about it. So it's very different from the input kernel, okay? But but uh, but let's try this. So the whole thing will be the same GP theory, except that the GP kernels will be renormalized by a scalar order parameter, and obeying similar self-consistent equations. That now the kernels will be the GP kernels, okay? Renormalized GP kernels. And here's an example. This is for MNIST. And again, we can look at the data. Uh, and uh, and, 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 and to, to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves, we choose, I'm, I'm showing examples where the, the number of, where, where P is larger than N0. So, uh, so, so the network, in order to train to the data to, to get a zero solution, uh, must use the nonlinearity. Okay, so we are, Alpha zero is bigger than one. We get zero training error because of the nonlinearity, and we look at the generalization as a function of n. 
This is the GP limit, again, there is no end dependent. This is our hack theory, renormalized, scalar renormalization. This is for high regularization, for low regularization. And this is the simulation. Amazing, I didn't believe it. Amazing. This is one of these lucky examples where physicists, not mathematicians, okay, say, well, some, when we are stressed out, okay, let's do some, something. Heuristic, we call it heuristic. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm very puzzled, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that always it works. When, you, when the parameters are close to the uh, interpolation threshold of the nonlinear case, which is p equals to n times n0, this breaks down, okay? And this I'll show on Monday. I don't want to show bad results in front of Andrea. Okay? <laughs> I'll show it on Monday. Okay? I'll stop here. <laughs>